to deny a people the right to self-determination for well on a hundred years is to subject them to slavery, to take away the resources of a people and refuse to give them anything in return is to subject them to slavery, to take away the land of a people who depend solely on land for their survival and refuse to pay them compensation is to subject them to genocide. Delta is one of the most important ecosystems in the world. Um, I think we're now number six or so in the world, the biggest oil. Most of the oil in Nigeria is from the Niger Delta, and Nigeria is the sixth largest oil producer in the world, and I think the tenth, ninth or tenth gas producer in the world. So a very important part of the global um, energy mix and the global economy, and also for the, for the environment. Um, because of uh, oil pollution and weak government regulation, um, the Niger Delta account for most of the oil, the gas that is fled around the world, um, a significant proportion of global warming. My name is Sakari Douglas Camp. And I was born in the Niger Delta in a little town called Buguma in the Niger Delta River State. I always thought it was one of the most beautiful places in the world because you could, um, you could get oysters from um, the um, suckers on the mangroves. The roots of the mangroves go into the water and if you cut off a root you pluck out a cluster of oysters and you can roast this on a fire like a kebab and just pluck out the oysters and eat, you know. Um, that's how beautiful and clear the water was when I was a child. And as I grew up, we began to have oil flares all over the place. And I was in England and I read in the... National Geographic magazine that there was a hole in the ozone layer in Australia and um, I realized as I read the article that this was because of the flaring in Nigeria and that really brought it home that the world was actually one even though people may not have realized it what happened in Nigeria affected Australia. The Ogoni people are situated in Nigeria, in Africa, in a state called River State. Um, we occupy a place called the Niger Delta. The issue of the Gun people is an issue of neglect, the issue of marginalization, and the issue relating to indigenous people. When my father started the campaign and Ken Saruiwa started the campaign, it was really about what was happening to, to his community. Um, the land that he knew that was a fertile, peaceful community had been impacted by oil negatively. Uh, my father was 17 when oil was discovered and uh, he began to, for him, he says he began to write letters um, to, to newspapers protesting about the impact. and. Um, by the time oil started being pumped out and there were and there were, you know in the civil war there were blowouts and oils were spilled into the creeks into the waters people began to see the impact of this the very negative impact of this thing uh, and after the oil price rise in the mid 70s then money also now became so you know suddenly this place that didn't have a, there were no cars and suddenly you began to see cars and things and then you began to see uh, people who were living in compounds like shell compounds, you know, people began to travel, began to see the riches that Nigeria was having. Bridges were being, magnificent bridges were being built. And uh, 
And so then we began to understand that this was happening because of the oil that was being taken from our community. And by the time people went to Abuja, the center of the government, and then television came and people could see, and people got more information, and we could see that the oil from here is what is you know, created all of these things. They said, well, okay, how come we're not getting these things? And they started asking questions. We started to fight the multinational company, particularly Shell and the Nigerian government, in 1990. That was when the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people was formed. And, and I think uh, by 1990, uh, my father had decided, although he had been raising these questions politically in his work, in his writing, they hadn't really, yeah, he hadn't had any impact on the debate in Nigeria. You know, Nigeria's um, political debate was not really, you know, there were many people other than my father that were advocating for the causes of the Niger Delta and the oil bearing communities. Um, but it was only when my father decided to take, to add the environmental aspect to it. Uh, and then that coincided with, I think, the fall of the Berlin Wall, where suddenly minorities that are trapped in federations became an issue in Eastern Europe. And then the environmental movement started, the Earth, Earth Summit in Rio, uh, and then the narratives of um, indigenous people against globalization. So all of these things all came together in the late 80s and, and early 90s. You know, my father because he was a consummate artist, writer, he knew how to engage journalists and, and tell a good story. He became like a symbol for many people of many things, cultural rights, language rights, um, human rights, environmental rights. So all these groups adopted uh, the story. I lived in England for most of my life. I must say that Nigeria and Britain have always been connected because of colonial past. Um, but I was a child born at the time when um, um, Nigeria became independent. And there was just great belief that went through the whole of society, um, kind of um, emphasizing that we had something to say in the world. Um, we had something to give to the world as Nigerians. And um, so when I talk about Nigerian festivals, whether it's masquerades or um, a Nigerian problem, um, like oil, um, or the state of Nigerian governance, um, which has to do with everything, um, it's part of my life here in London, as well as in Nigeria. When Mosul was formed, Mosul had some demands that they made to the Nigerian government and people and the oil companies. That demand, we put it in a in a structured form, which we call the Ogoni Bill of Rights. We have to fight the oil companies and the Nigerian government for our land, for our farming, and for our fishing. A lot of Ogoni people are not employed by the oil companies. Government do employ them, but that was not enough. We depend on our land so the environment and our land is extremely very, very important to us. That is an important part of our life. 
So we don't joke with the environment. We don't play with it. Um, that is our culture, our tradition. Everything is based on our land. So we don't joke with it. When oil was discovered in Nogoni in 1958, we thought that they were coming with something good for our people. But we did not realize that rather they were just destroying our environment gradually and gradually. So our people, because of that, are very, very conscious of every single thing that the oil company does. We studied the agitation, as I've already mentioned, through Mossop, and because it was an organized agitation, it became extremely very difficult for the oil companies and the government not to listen to our voice. We used to have individuals coming out to complain about destruction of their land, but the government will just not listen to them. The oil companies wouldn't listen to them. But when we came as a group and started fighting, they now knew that seriously, these people meant business. When my father um, decided to, as he said, he'd been a writer for, for 30 odd years trying to advance the causes of, of the minorities in, in the Niger Delta and Ogoni through his writing. And he hadn't really made much impact. And so he decided in his own words to take the words to the streets. And so he, he formed, he was part of the group that formed Mossop, the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people, whose um, mandate was to raise awareness of, of, our, of ourselves as Ogoni people, to raise our, our psyche, uh, and to also to protest against our marginalization within Nigeria and to protest against the environmental, the, the destruction of our environment um, uh, and to appeal to the international community to, to come to help um, save us. And, um, and he began, you know, with meetings with young people telling them, you know, look, this is who we are, this is where we've been, this is what, this is, what is happening to us. And I think he energized a lot of young people um, in Ogoni who had felt just like me, had grown up marginalized in the society, not proud of our roots, afraid to speak our language and suddenly you know this thing gave us our, our pride back, gave a lot of people a sense of direction um, and gave voice to, their, to, to an anger about the lack of opportunity um, in, in the midst of so much wealth. <laughs> In 1993, we had the first protest, first big protest, which had about 300,000 Ogonis came out to protest against the destruction of the Ogoni environment. And during that protest, no single store was thrown. It was peaceful, well organized, non violently, and it was very, very successful. We are going to demand our rights peacefully, non-violently, and we shall win. Yeah. That was when the government of Nigeria and the oil companies knew that these people, because of our organization, that we were serious. And this alarmed the, the federal government. Um, and the federal government sent in troops to because Shell pulled out, claiming that they were being harassed and they were unable to, unable to, to, to work. And for that, um, to the to the government of Nigeria, when an oil company pulls out, it's a red flag, because once the oil stops, Nigeria does not have money. Um, you know, seventy percent of our our uh, of our economy, uh, or ninety percent of our foreign exchange, comes from oil. Um, you know, it's changing it's bit by bit, but mostly if we don't have oil, the Nigerian government cannot function. So the response of the military government was to send in troops 
to pacify the Ogoni um, and to ensure that Shell could come back and to continue, could continue building the Trans Niger pipeline and, and various other uh, and to secure its assets and so on. And that began a process over the next 18 months um, of, uh, of clashes um, between non-violent protesters. You know, Mossop was formed on, on non-violence, you know, my father as a, as a writer. And also he also looked at the, the numbers, you know, we're very small people, we can't, we, we live on an open floodplain, there's nowhere we can hide, we don't have money, we can't have access, we can't take on the might of the Nigerian army. 1994, there was an incident when four of our Ogoni chiefs were killed under suspicious circumstances. We accused the Nigerian government, the Nigerian security forces, of being responsible for the death of those people, even till tomorrow. Because of that, Ogoni was put under military occupation. There were more arrests. The military invaded Ogoni and stayed in Ogoni and arrested all the leaders of Mossop, all the activists, and Ogoni chiefs were also arrested and detained. During that period, there was a lot of destruction in Ogoni. They destroyed our houses, they destroyed our farms, and so many things were destroyed and a lot of people were killed. We lost over 2,000 Ogonis during that period. And then on May 21st, 1994, uh, my father and others were arrested. They were held for again for another six months before they were brought to trial. And during a trial that was described as, as fraudulent and, and inconclusive, uh, fraudulent and um, and even went against their, their own provisions of their own, their own laws. Um, uh, my father and eight others were found guilty and executed in November 1995. When you look at it, you know, he was held with, without uh, in detention, without access to his lawyers for six months. The, even the provisions of the the tribunal that, that were not even obeyed by the by the military themselves so um, clearly an injustice was done um, whether you look at it legally from a human rights point of view legally um, nine people were unjustly executed for a crime that no one knows whether actually even happened or not I knew of him as a writer I knew of him as a politician um, because after our civil war, he helped to build um, Port Harcourt, which is like, you know, our, our major city in our state. Um, and um, Ken Sarawi was responsible for um, housing and all sorts of things um, at the time after the war. Um, I, so I knew of him from a distance. But when his troubles um, happened, I was in London. And we, we all watched with bated breath as his son rushed to a UN conference to try and save his life. You know, we were so surprised and shocked. And when his execution happened, um, we, I, we were lost, you know, really lost, because we just thought we killed a star. How could we kill a star, especially with, um, without a proper trial? And um, I actually did a piece of work around um, Ken being lost. And at the time, I was making sculptures about festivals in Nigeria. And um, at certain festivals, when a disaster happens with a, a masked player, a masquerader, um, they sometimes have to be rescued. Um, from the arena because if they're not rescued the crowd can actually go in and disgrace them take their costume off and show them as a man when they, they've been playing a god it's a bit complicated but I did a piece which is called Alagba in Limbo and it's a sculpture where you know four figures are carrying a masquerader and the masquerader seems as if he's dead with his arms 
out like this and they're actually trying to rescue him from the arena but he looks dead or lost because you know that's what happened to um, um, the Delta when Ken um, was killed we lost a hero sort of thing mm -hmm.